church. There you go. Thank you, Ruthann. We do have a couple other announcements I'll call your attention to in your bulletin. The uh, nominating committee is currently looking for a nursery coordinator. The details are given to you right here in your bulletin insert. We also have a sign-up sheet for Haymarket Day. Haymarket Day, how many of you have been to Haymarket Day before? Raise your hand. Most of you, but not all. Uh, last year was my first time, and I thought everybody was exaggerating when they said more than 30,000 people would come to Little Haymarket. I thought, oh right, like the fish was really this big. I'm, but it's true, that many people do come to Haymarket. So we would love to have you come and uh, help man the booths here when we welcome people. And so if you'd like to sign up for that after the worship service, right here in the overflow room to my left, to your right, uh, is the sign-up sheet for Haymarket Day. We need some people to show up at 8 a.m. and others to come at 10 and some to come at noon uh, and stay until 3. So you can take any shift that you want but we need you to sign up for that. So, lots of things going on. I'll let you read the other announcements. Also, we're delighted to have you here today. So, I'd like to ask all of us to stand and greet those around you. two more announcements to give you. One about the funeral on Thursday. Cheryl Cox is going to be um, facilitating that dinner. If you are interested in contributing items of food, if you could get with Cheryl, um, your email I'm sure is published, but she's, can you stand up and wave? There you go. <laughs> Get with her. Also about Haymarket Day, it is a little bit different this year. All of the vendors, Washington Street will be open at 6 a.m. for vendors to start coming in um, and setting up their booths. They do use our parking lot to park in, but we try to accommodate, of course, especially the outreach committee that is going to be here. Um, there's parking. I know there's shuttles down at the QBE building as well as Tyler, and you can park across the street in Green Hill Crossings. But um, the parade this year does not start until 11 o'clock. So that's a little bit later than um, has, it has previously been because this is the 30th anniversary of Haymarket Day. They're expecting about 35,000 people. Um, so it's going to be a lot of people. So picture 35,000 people are going to be crossing in front of our church, um, which is huge. So the more people we have out there to help promote the church, to be excited. I know the Seroptimist group of Manassas, we've got numerous ladies that are involved with that organization as well as myself are going to be here um, helping 
out front, give out information um, about the Lord. So please find that in your heart if you're interested in helping um, get with one of the outreach committee members. We, there is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin boards outside where you can sign up with that ministry effort. I now would like us to transition into a time of reverent praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God as we give him the honor and the glory this morning. Let us bow together in prayer. <coughs> Compassionate God, who dwells in the highest places and yet walks in the midst of all human life, look upon us and all of our faults and our failings this morning with tenderness and hope. Turn your eyes towards the places that we would hope to have you remain and begin the work of reclaiming the barren and infertile landscape in our human frame. Listen to our sorrows, Father, as we remember how we have failed in our relationships with others in the world and with you. Forgive the unkind words and the thoughts, the unwillingness to change the pattern of our lives, even when we know the harm our actions cause and the inability to create a time and a space to listen to your voice. Hear us as we seek to be restored to live your story in our actions. Grant us the undeserving gift of your loving and sheltering arms this week as we seek to share your love with others and bring peace and comfort to those grieving the loss of our dear sister, Evelyn Ruth Mead. Allow us to be your bright light in a dark world and provide the vessel necessary to allow your will to be done. As we come together now, as a church family, humbly praying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. stand together as we say our responsive reading this morning. If you would turn in your hymn books to page 444. The theme of this responsive reading is repentance. Godly grief produces a repentance not to be regretted and leading to salvation, but worldly grief produces death. 
repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Christ has liberated us into freedom. Therefore stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Ironically, this was not planned, but we will sing this again on Thursday at Evelyn's funeral. But one of her favorite hymns was hymn number 230, The Old Rugged Cross. Let us sing this together. <coughs>
Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I will read from uh, Proverbs 5, um, verses 1 through 14, and in your pew Bible it's um, 990. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ears to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to the path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life you will groan when uh, your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Drink water from your own cistern. I now would like to invite the children down for children's sermon time with Dr. Olson. Dad, you're even eating my cookie. 
My sister took my cookie. My dad took my cookie. That's not fair. Four. And dad said, well, if we were to say that stealing from someone else was a sin, then I would make sure that didn't happen in our house anymore. And Jeffrey said, yeah, I think we should have that as a <laughs> And about that time, Mom brought over two more chocolate chip cookies, so Jeffrey got his cookies. But he also learned a lesson. God calls certain things sin because they're really hurtful to other people or to us or to God. And that's why certain things are called sin. And the way to avoid sin is not to pretend that there are no sins, but moms and dads teach us what's right and what's wrong. And as we get older, we begin reading a certain book. Anybody have a guess what book that is? The Bible. And it teaches us more about what's right and what's wrong. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Well, as you read in that, you learn about things. And God's not trying to be negative when he says certain things are sin. But he lists things that are sins that really end up hurting other people or hurting us. And that's why God calls those things sin. And we need to not do those things. And that's why moms and dads tell us not to do bad things. Because they hurt other people and sometimes they can get hurt. Remember that the next time you eat it, chocolate chip. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the boys and girls, and I pray that as they think about sin, they'll realize that when you label some activity as sin, you're just trying to keep us from hurting other people or from hurting ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Because right, if somebody took my chocolate chip cookie, they are going to get hurt. I could assure. I would. I would pray through it. <laughs> Let us continue to give back to God this morning as we stand together and sing our offertory hymn, number ninety-eight. Come, thou font of every blessing. Let's stand together. Let's pray together. 
Compassionate God, we are so happy to offer you these monetary gifts this morning. We recognize that we are able to worship in this place because of the generous giving of this congregation. Yet our giving and our prayer extend beyond us. We pray that these offerings and tithes this morning will be used to reach out to others in the community and around the world who need to find a joyful trust in you. All praise and glory to you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
The scripture on which I'll base my sermon today is from Paul's most famous letter, his letter to the Romans. So let me invite you to open your Bibles and turn to Romans. It's in the New Testament after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts, which tells about Paul and the other apostles, their travels, and then begins Paul's letters, starting with the longest one, Romans. Uh, if you forgot your Bible, please open the Pew Bible to 1745 which is where you will find Romans chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 16 through 32. Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what they may know about God is, in plain, is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served created beings rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what they ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
The young couple wanted to talk. They sat down and spoke with the minister a few light words at first, and then they got a little more serious. They said, we really can't understand how living together could be wrong or sinful. We've heard that traditionally the church has said that, but uh, our experience is, is different. Mike has been so good for me, Susie said. He, he, he's brought me out of my shell. He builds up my self-esteem when I'm low. He, he lifts me up. And Mike said similar things about Susie. They said, we've been together for two years now, and we can't see how anything that we're having together could possibly be sinful. Preacher, we wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, isn't the Bible just sort of outmoded and out old-fashioned about these things? Well, and if we're, we're going to set our religious faith on the basis of what our society says is right and wrong, then certainly we have to toss a lot of Scripture out. But, but if we are people who say that the, the Bible is our authority, that through this book God has spoken to us and continues to speak to us, then when we find something in the book that, that reads differently from the way we're living, then we probably ought to think that maybe I need to change some of the way that I'm, I'm living. And that's, that's right at the heart of Romans 1. And so today we're going to take a look at this first chapter that Paul wrote. We introduced it last week, but today we pick up at the two verses that, that almost all biblical interpreters agree, the core verses that, that explain the thesis of Romans. If you've got a study Bible, you might even put a star next to them or underline them. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel or good news. That's what euangelion means in, in Greek. Good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, and then he quotes Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. And so this is the key theme. What is the good news? Paul's explaining it to the church at Rome. You remember last week we talked about why he wrote this letter. He was uh, in Corinth, and he sent the letter uh, by a young woman named what? Phoebe, who visited us last Sunday. And... He sent the letter to Rome saying, I have longed to come to you and I'm planning to come. First I've got to go east though. First I've got to go to the eastern Mediterranean to visit Jerusalem. I've been collecting a, a, a lot of a mission offering for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. i got to take it there. But after that, then I'm coming west. I'm going to come visit you in Rome and I'm going to stop in Rome and I want you to become a missionary sending base for me, when I go even further west, the furthest west country in the Mediterranean, namely what? Spain. I'm planning to go to Spain, and I want you guys to help me. And that's why he writes the letter. But he includes so much theology because he wants to make sure that he and the Roman church are on the same page, that they understand the gospel in the same way. And so he then explains what the good news is. And it's a little bit of a shock. When he talks about the good news, and then the next verse is, the wrath of God. Well, when you think of good news, the wrath of God is probably not the first thing that comes in, in your mind. It's not the first thing that comes in my mind. But, but Paul goes there, and he goes on to explain that God has created this huge world. And he has spoken both through his written word. At this point, it was just the Old Testament. That was the only scripture that the early Christians had. And also the created world that God has made. And we see the created world every time we go out. And especially on a day uh, like today, a beautiful day, sunshiny. And we maybe can drive down Skyline Drive. How many of you have been down Skyline Drive before? One of Linda's all-time favorite places to go. I've got to take her this fall. That's our agreement. Every fall, I take her down Skyline Drive to see it. And you see God's beautiful creation. And Paul says, well, God has given us this creation, and all people have the ability to see at least some of those things. And indeed, what the scholars call general revelation, that, that God gives to all people some of the basics, 
that we all understand at least something about what God has for us, the difference between right and wrong. In every culture, despite differences in laws, there is a basic sense of right and wrong in every culture, and that, that comes from God. But then Paul continues, the reality is that people have rejected God's wisdom. They have rejected God's revelation. Paul puts it this way in verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to become wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. And so it was in the ancient world, in the Roman world, you had lots of pagan temples with images sometimes like a, a, an image of Zeus that might look like a really well-built bodybuilder, but other images like some of the Egyptian gods and goddesses that had uh, heads that looked like animal heads. And these were the different idols that people worshipped. Now we don't do that same thing today, uh, although it's interesting that many of our pro football teams have... Uh, bears and lions and they have human heads like redskins or the hat from a human uh, uh, like a cowboy hat and we we pull a lot of those images into our favorite football teams don't we but the idea of an idol is that it's anything that pushes god off center stage in your life it doesn't even have to be a bad thing in and of itself i don't think there's anything bad about football at all in fact I'm very excited about football season starting this fall. Wake Forest, I'm sure you're all anxious to know, plays Tulane Thursday night. and I'm sure you'll all be tuned in to watch my Demon Deacons open the season. But if we let football or any other sport push into the center of our lives and push God off to the side, it's become an idol. It has become something that's more important to us than God. And that would be the same way if it was the garden club or your favorite, uh, your favorite hobby. Whatever it would be, anything we let push God off center stage is, has become an idol to us. And we begin to drift farther from God when we let that happen. And Paul thought a lot of people in the Roman world had done that. And he also said as people push God to the side and ignore God's written word, they end up engaging in behavior that, that is sinful and that gets them into trouble. Our society is, is very anxious to say, no, that's not a sin, this is not a sin. Yes, even though historically all these behaviors were called sinful, we're going to say they're not. But we keep bumping into the fact that people then begin harming one another and doing things against one another. Because God labeled behavior sinful not to be arbitrary, but to keep us from harming one another and to keep us from harming ourselves. And so Paul gets pretty detailed here in chapter 1. When I was a boy, I don't remember this part of Romans being read very much in church, maybe on rare occasion. But when I was little, we didn't talk much about sex. And I feel certain that the preacher never said anything about women exchanging natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And the men being abandoning natural relations with women and inflamed with lust for one another. I'm sure those verses were in the Bible, but I don't remember hearing that. How many of you grew up in churches where they didn't talk about things like that? So a lot of you grew up. We just didn't, we sort of skipped over those verses. Didn't read those verses. We read the first half of Romans and skipped to Romans 2. That was one way to dodge the issue. Today, it's different. Sometimes churches skip those verses, not because our society doesn't talk about it, but because, in general, American society say, hey, wait a second, I think any kind of sexual expression, as long as it doesn't involve adults and children, anything else is fair game. And we shouldn't be judgmental. That's the worst thing of all. And so sometimes churches now skip the second half of Romans 1 because it's way too explicit to say that these kind of sexual relations are, are wrong according to God's word. And the Bible's really pretty clear about it. 
I've had some friends tell me, oh, I think that must not really be what Paul means. And I've done a lot of research on these verses, but it's really pretty straightforward. I don't think you need a PhD in New Testament studies to get it. And pick your translation as you wish and go read it. Paul's just pretty straightforward. These behaviors, which were very common in the ancient Roman world, homosexual behavior was very common among the Greeks and Romans. And Paul and all the traditional Jews said, yeah, that shows how sinful the Gentiles are. And Paul labels them right here. I feel very confident that all the Jewish Christian members at the Church of Rome were reading this and said, you tell them, Paul, those guys are really sinful. But Paul doesn't stop there. He continues on. And he says, yeah, any time we as people turn our backs on God, and refuse to listen to him, God sort of gives us over to what we want to do. If you look in verse uh, 24, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. And then in verse 26, Because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts. And then in verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. If we just turn our backs on God, eventually he'll say, okay, you live your life your way. And then we get ourselves in lots of trouble. It, it doesn't always happen immediately. Sometimes things may seem to go well for a season. But eventually we end up in lots of trouble. I've been reading this week a book, Out of a Far Country, by Christopher Wan and Angela Wan. It's a young Asian American man and his mother. And it tells the story of how each of them were broken in different ways. Christopher, as a young man, getting into the homosexual lifestyle in the 90s, and uh, finally coming out to his parents who were traditional Asians and very shocked and dismayed that their son would be involved in this. But saying, you know, I'm, I'm leaving my parents and their old traditions behind. I'm, I've got a lot of new friends now in the gay community and, and I'm, I'm going to have and enjoy life there and become a dentist and I'm gonna, I've got my life planned out for me. And Angela stuck in a marriage that was pretty traditional but very barren for her and no communication between she and her husband and and when her son came out of the closet it just ruined her life and she she even thought about suicide and yet this story tells how each of them found God it took a long time for Christopher it was only after he began enjoying drugs and then eventually deciding he could make a lot of money selling drugs until the DEA broke into his front door and he found himself in the Atlanta penitentiary and then called his mom. Because where do you turn when you're in jail and you've got nobody else? And eventually, each one of them in very different routes and very different ways came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They each had to face their own brokenness. They each had to say, man, I've really screwed up. I've really made mistakes. And yet they came back together and Jesus Christ put them back together. It's an amazing, amazing story. And it reminds us that all of us, in different ways, are sinners. And sometimes each of us disappoints God and we're far from God. It's certainly true that Roman 1 points out that homosexual behavior is sinful, both for men and, and for women. But Paul also adds some other sins. Paul says in verse 29, they become filled with every kind of wickedness. Greed. Some of you are greedy. Depravity. Full of envy. Some of you envy. Murder. I've not done that one. Thought about it, but I've, I've not... I've not done that one. That's all right. Ruth Bell Graham, when they asked her about the difficulties that she and Billy had in their marriage, one of the reporters said, have you ever thought about divorce? She said, oh, no, no, I've thought about murder at times. 
And that's Ruth Bell Graham. So I, I know that we have these thoughts. Paul says, they are gossips. Some of you like to gossip. Slanderers. God-haters. Not, not many of you are God-haters. Insolent. Arrogant. Some of you struggle with arrogance. Boastful. That's been one of my problems since I was little, when I discovered that if I got good grades, I could boast about it. Although the other students didn't seem to like that. <laughs> they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. None of our teenagers ever do that, fortunately, here at Haymarket. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Some of you struggle in showing mercy to other people. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things, and now some Christians will like say, oh, the such things, that's the homosexual stuff. Well, yes, but it's all those other things as well. Those who do such things deserve death, but they not only continue to do them, they approve of those who practice them. Paul has come to the deep conviction that as sinful as all those Greek and Roman lustful people were, that he, Paul, also was a sinner. In fact, he says in 1 Timothy, I'm chief of sinners. I was far from what God wanted me to be. And so the answer is not to pretend that none of us are sinners. The answer is just to say, you know, the Bible makes it pretty clear that all of us are sinners. And so, is homosexual behavior sinful? Well, yes, absolutely. The Bible is real clear about it. Are the things that the rest of us do also sinful? Yeah, the Bible is pretty clear about that too. In fact, it says the only hope that we have, because we're sinners, the only hope that we have is that Jesus Christ looked down on us with all of our flaws and weaknesses, and including people like Christopher Juan. And Jesus Christ loved us so much. He said, I will die on the cross. That Christopher Juan, who's engaging in homosexual behavior, who's involved in drugs, so that he could be saved. Because I love him that deeply. And he looks at each one of you. Not because you've managed to fool him and he doesn't know what your sins are. You may have fooled me. I may have no idea what your sins are. And you don't know all of mine either. Don't ask Linda because she's, she's not going to tell you. <laughs> but God looks and sees each of our sins and knows the worst about us and still loves us so much that his own son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross that we might be saved. It is an amazing word of grace. America needs it. We need it today. We can't keep it as a secret to ourselves. On Haymarket Day, there'll be 35,000 people that walk right in front of our church. Maybe half of them already know Christ as Lord and Savior. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're still a traditional enough community that it's 22,000 out of 35,000. But it's nowhere near all of them. And my Bible lets me know that God doesn't want us to keep this grace a secret. That he wants us to enjoy it and be grateful that we're forgiven. But it's not supposed to be like a secret society. You know, where we have certain secrets that we don't tell anybody. We're supposed to tell who? Everybody. About this salvation that God offers because he loves us so deeply. And that's really at the heart of the gospel. It's what Paul's writing about. He's writing as a man who was transformed from his experience with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Shocked to discover that he too was a sinner. But then thankful to discover that God's grace included him. And that Jesus Christ died on the cross for Paul. And for Mark Olson. And for you. If there's one person here today who's never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and received that forgiveness that can come to you only through God's grace, we'll give you an opportunity to do it here at the end of the service. And if there's someone who's already a Christian 
and you've already received God's grace and you know you're saved not because of your good works, but in spite of your sin, because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you already know that, but, but you've been looking for a church home, maybe today is the day for you to say, I want to become part of God's family here at Haymarket Baptist. If you have any decision to make, I'll be at the front and Ruth Ann will join me. And we are going to sing hymn number 391, We Are Called to Be God's People. Let's stand and we will sing together. <laughs>